the historical roots of the rapidly expanding cult of Mary with the worship of ancient goddesses and other pagan practices have been examined in an earlier chapter. Such links now seem to strengthen what we assumed before, or even proved before. The New Age movement is undoubtedly advancing on many fronts, not least in the Church, which will not endure sound doctrine, having itching ears. Many Christians have drunk deep drafts of New Age potions. For example, holistic health, hypnosis, yoga, inner healing, meditation, psychical research and awareness training, and many have imbibed new doctrines and heresies based on the humanistic and positive thinking of Taylor de Chardin, Norman Vincent Peale and others which provide the church with its emphasis on an earthly kingdom now, the social gospel and society reconstructed for Christianized with kingdom principles for the Lord's return. Restorationist leader Bryn Jones, writing in the beginning of 1991, promised his followers that, quote, by the power of his spirit, we will bring all that is against God and man beneath Christ's authority. God's church will be the most influential body of people on earth in the final period of this age. Unquote. This is indeed a prophetic word, but it is fulfilled in scripture only by the apostate church of the book of Revelation. Hello my dear brothers and sisters, this is Jörg Lissmann once again from YouTube channel Jogler 66 Hour of the Truth. Today I've come to you to read to you a video that is called Tradition. Of course we are talking about the Roman Catholic Church's tradition, because we are dealing with the book All Roads Lead to Rome from Michael de Semlian. A book which I very much like. The more that I read it right now, I've started reading it some months ago, but only until I think this chapter that I'm starting right here, because I was busy with so many other things. And I selected this book also because I think it fits very well in the line what I was reading with the books like Rulers of Evil before and Babylon Mystery Religion. Now uploading, uh, now the uploading is done of my last book here before, uh, Behind the Dictators by Herbert Leo Lehman, and um, Leo Herbert Lehman, and I also find this book in the same line. The only thing that I love more about this book is that it really goes more into uh, Bible teaching and the mistakes that this exposes between Roman Catholicism and the Bible, because Behind the Dictators was more a little bit a political book. Anyway, I'm always looking forward to even my next um, uh, topic that I've planned to read, but before that, of course, we have here today the reading of Chapter 4, Tradition, which is not a very long chapter. <clears throat> so I'm going to start on page 58 for the one who has his own copy and wants to read along with me. In examining the subject of holy tradition, it would be helpful to first, uh, first for the reader to appreciate the extent to which the individual Roman Catholic is bound by confession of faith to subscribe to all that is added to scripture by church. Now, after this little sentence of introduction, I always have my first sentence of comment, of course. The individual Roman Catholic is bound by confession of faith to subscribe to all that is added to scripture by church. We will learn later on in this chapter, when I continue reading, what the Bible has to say about adding to the word, adding to or leaving out. The Bible is very clear on those things. And what you have to understand, of course, is that you always have a choice whether you adhere to the teachings of man in this place called tradition or even holy tradition or you adhere to the teachings of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ and his word. 
and it is not very wise to make any compromise. Anyway, such confession includes the following, quote, I admit and embrace the most firmly, most firmly the apostolic and ecclesiastical traditions and all the other constitutions and prescriptions of the Church. Besides, I accept without hesitation and profess all that has been handed down, defined and declared by the sacred canons of, uh, and by the general councils, especially by the sacred council of Trent and by the Vatican General Council, and in a special manner concerning the primacy and infallibility of the Roman Pontiff. This same Catholic faith, outside of which nobody can be saved, which I now freely profess, and to which I truly adhere, the same I promise and swear to maintain and profess until last breath of life. Unquote. You can read that in Roman Catholic Catechism from Gaiaman, page 101 to 103. And of course, I have to make a few comments here. It is stated, <clears throat> I accept without hesitation the sacred canons and the, uh, and the general uh, councils, especially the sacred council of Trent. I personally think that if the Catholics who swear this oath, that's what it is, because it says swear to maintain, to maintain and profess until the last breath of life, if Catholics knew what they swore here, that they are swearing to the, as it is said, especially by the sacred council of Trent, they knew what that Council of Trent was all about. I think they would not go to swear this. Because in my heart I think that every Catholic is only betrayed because of this little 10% of truth that is taught through the Roman Catholic Church. He does not see these 10, these 90% of lies because he thinks when this 10% is true, everything is true. And I think also, I'm even convinced, that if a Catholic knew what the Council of Trent, which is called sacred in this confession, was all about, if that Roman Catholic knew all the more than 100 anathemas, curses, spoken out at the Council of Trent, if every individual Catholic knew what was going on, I do not think, at least I believe so in my heart, that they would do this oath. Because we have to understand, as what we call us Protestants, Bible-believing Christians, give it a name, whatever you want. When you accept Jesus Christ as your Savior, and you follow the Bible, and you follow Jesus, our Lord, you have to believe in the goodness of the people. You have to love you are other people. You have to love your neighbor like yourself. And that is not so hard to do. The problem is only <clears throat> that your neighbor is caught in a system that is satanic, that is pure of the devil, and he is just not aware of it. And I hope that many Catholics will come to watch this video, not only this video, but the whole book reading of All Roads Lead to Rome, to understand that, to understand how they have been deceived, that actually when they mean and profess in their heart for themselves that they love other people, that they love Jesus Christ, and they want to bring that love into fruition, they don't need to swear a confession or oath like this to the Roman Catholic Church, and especially not, as I read, in the special manner concerning the primacy and infallibility of the Roman Pontiff. The Bible says that none is righteous. So how can the Pope be infallible? He is only a man. He cannot be infallible. He misses, he fails like every man. 
We are all born in trespasses and sins, and we all have fallen short in the glory of God. So has the Pope. But still people swear this oath. And I think <clears throat> that is just because they do not think about what they are doing at that moment. And I hope that a lot of Catholics, when listening to what I'm saying here right now, and what Michael de Semlian wrote in his book, and read it for themselves, or listen to what I say about it, they will come out of it. As God says in Revelation 18, verse 4, Come out of her, my people, that you be not partakers of her sins, and you do not receive of her plagues, because God hath remembered her iniquities. The Confession from the, Catholic, uh, from the Catechism adds to Scripture, which is expressly forbidden by Scripture. So, when I accept Jesus Christ as my Lord, whose words are to be found in the Bible, and I accept the Bible as the authority of God speaking to me, then I also have to obey what the Scripture says. And the Scripture expressly forbids adding or taking away from it. Swearing to the Catechism is also forbidden by Scripture. Now we're going to read in Deuteronomy chapter 4, verse 2, quote, Ye shall not add unto the word <coughs> Ye shall not add unto the word which I command you, neither shall ye diminish aught from it, that ye may keep the commandments of the Lord your God, which I command you. Unquote. And we read in James in the New Testament, chapter 5, verse 12, quote, But above all things, my brethren, swear not, neither by heaven, neither by the earth, neither by any other oath, but let your yea be a yea, and your nay a nay, lest ye fall into condemnation. Unquote. I really think it is important to always take the Bible next to you when you are speaking about something of the Bible. And there, when you check it, precept by precept, you will understand that the Bible explains itself and everything that we have to know is actually written in the Bible. So we are not to swear. How about all the people who join Freemasonry? The first thing they do is swear. The Bible says do not. And they even swear on the King James Bible. To make it even worse, just open your eyes. And think about it. The Council of Trent gave tradition equal authority to the Bible itself, and without doubt much is added to the Word of God. The Council of Trent gave tradition equal authority. So that means that I have to compromise the Word of God, because whether I adhere to the Word of God, or I adhere to the Word of man, the Council of Trent, which the Catholic swears in the Confession to uphold its teachings and to profess its teachings until the last breath of life, the Council of Trent is the teaching of man, not the teaching of God. So, I think that all the Roman Catholics are just caught in the lie that the Pope is the Vicar of Christ. Because as the Roman Catholic Church teaches, when the Pope speaks ex cathedra, it is as Jesus Christ speaks. But that is a problem. Because then Jesus Christ, who is now on earth in the form of the Pope, if that's so, contradicts himself to what he stated before in the Bible. Did Jesus ever contradict himself? Did God ever contradict himself? Did God ever lie? Well, when you answer that question with no, then you know that the Council of Trent gave tradition equal authority to the Bible itself, and without doubt much is added to the Word of God, as I've just read, 
that can not be the same God. Well, when you understand that, then we are already a step further into the right direction. Now, Vatican II reminded Catholics that the Church does not draw her certainty about all revealed truths from the Holy Scriptures alone. Unquote. We can read that in Vatican II, the Constitution on Divine Revelation, in paragraph 9. The leading American ecumenical magazine, New Covenant, reminded its readers in January 1987, quote, Vatican II documents teach that both scripture and tradition must be accepted and honored with equal feelings of devotion and reverence. Unquote. So that means, whether God speaks through the Bible to you, or the Pope speaks, or the Cardinal, or the Bishop, or even the priest, the words, the words are worth the same. I, of course, do not agree with that. But people really should think about this and compare the things that men say against what God says. And where there is a discrepancy, where there is not the same set that is stated in the Bible, I think then you have to make a choice. And that is a chance for every betrayed Catholic to see it. Do I adhere to God, or do I adhere to man? Now what does the Bible say about the tradition of men? Paul warned in Colossians chapter 2, verse 8, quote, Beware lest any man spoil you through philosophy and vain deceit after the tradition of men, after the rudiments of the world, and not after Christ. Unquote. Concerned evangelicals, including many in the ecumenical movement, have looked keenly to the renewal of, uh, to challenge the tradition of councils and decrees that supplements or supersedes the scriptures. But so far, they have looked in vain. Visibly, at least, Catholicism is not ferment, or, nor are its institutions or, and dogmas under siege. According to her catechism, the Roman Church alone is the one true Church that Christ founded, the chief attributes of which are authority, infallibility and indefectibility. And therefore we can read in the Baltimore Catechism, 1969, Catholic Book Publishing. Baltimore Catechism. Why is that important? Baltimore was the first Roman Catholic diocese in the United States of America, founded by John Carroll, 26 years of Jesuitical training, the founder of Georgetown University, the man who consecrated his diocese to Mary, the Virgin, the so-called Mother of God. Of course, that is in the Baltimore Catechism. Semper e Adam means always the same. Rome does not change her dogmas. She alters her style, certainly, but not her substance. This is very important. She alters her style, but not her substance. What does that mean? It means that the Roman Catholic Church gives to old dogmas, to old tradition, which are all pagan, here and there new words. And when something is old is given a new word, People who have never heard the old world, the next generation, do not recognize it as something that already existed in the past. They think that it's something new, or they only heard this new word, and that sounds so much better. Uh, do you know how they call that? Sophistry and casistry. Cunning, using and misusing and abusing words and language. And who is the master of that? Right. The Medici learning. The Jesuit order. 
the military order of the Roman Catholic Church is master in casuistry and sophistry. And therefore I'd like to advise you to go to Richard Bennett and his website, BereanBeacon.org. Check him out. He was a priest in the Roman Catholic Church for 22 years and he can read the Latin encyclicals and bulls from the Pope and can tell you and analyze them because he can see through the sophistry and casistry used in there. He can actually put into light where she alters her style but not her substance. Her style, she alters the words she expresses their traditions with, but the substance of the traditions is not changed. Rome never changes. Her face changes. She is very different in different countries also. In England, she adopts a high moral tone represented in the media as being firmer than that of any other part of the perceived church. Cardinal Hume has emerged at the center of our national life, speaking with authority and clarity about the great moral issues of the day. Unpalatable papal dogma such as Humanae Vitae, banning artificial contraception is played down by the church while committed Catholics lead Christians in the fight against the abortions legislation. The same Catholic leaders have founded the new movement for Christian democracy, an all-party, non-denominational organization committed to bringing Christian values back into British political life. In countries where Roman Catholicism's grip is surer, standards do not rise so high. Now here you have, and we will go into that in a minute, but here you have a wonderful example of how different the face that the Roman Catholic shows itself to the public is depending on the country where it rains or doesn't rain. In countries, especially like the United States of America, you have in the head in the beginning not the Roman Catholic Church, but the American Catholic Church. And if you want to learn about that, go to Tom Fress's reading of Global Vatican. I upload the videos on my Vimeo channel and you can otherwise go to First Amendment Radio, whether on the internet or in the archives there, or you go to this YouTube channel of Nicholas from First Amendment Radio and watch the videos he uploaded there of Tom Fress reading an Inquisition update The Global Vatican where he explains that in the beginning of the United States of America Catholics were such a big minority that they needed to adhere to their own instead of to the Pope that if they swore open allegiance to the Pope they would have been toast because of so many the overwhelming majority, 98% of the population at the time of the colonies, were Protestant. And the Roman Catholic Church could never have prospered. So when the Roman Catholic Church is in the minority, she screams for religious liberty. We need religious liberty. We need freedom of religion. And what do you have written in your constitution in the United States of America? Of course, freedom of religion. Because from that moment on, Roman Catholics could also be part of official life. They could have offices they couldn't have had before. They could hold their mass and all their superstitious and idolatrous religion practiced it all over the country, which was forbidden before 1776. But in countries where the Roman Catholic Church reigns supreme, oh, you will see another face of the Roman Catholic Church. In Uganda, Haiti and the Philippines, to name but three in different parts of the world, Roman Catholicism is fully integrated into local paganism and the gospel totally obscured within it. In the Philippines, missionaries regularly have a glimpse of the other phase of Catholicism which is not to be seen in England. At Easter time, young Filipinos do penance for serious sins by being nailed to the cross and left to hang for several hours at a time. An article in the Times in 1987 described this dreadful tradition, explaining that in this way the penitents believe 
that they obtain forgiveness from their God via his priest. Unquote. You can read that in the Times from 18th of April 1987. Where does the Bible say that you have to nail yourself to the cross for the forgiveness of sins? Jesus Christ said, if you love me, take up your cross and follow me. He didn't say, get nailed to the cross and your sins be forgiven. And surely not that via a priest they obtain forgiveness, forgiveness of their sins. Again, false teaching. Again, Babylonian tradition. Again, not the word of the Bible. In a number of countries in Africa and Haiti, the local power of the priest is equated to that of uh, to that of which the. <laughs> Sorry, <laughs> I gotta start this again. Not such a difficult sentence. <laughs> in a number of countries in Africa and in Haiti, the local power of the priest is equated to that of the witch doctor or the voodoo god. In primitive and superstitious cultures, the church exerts a stranglehold over all aspects of life, not dissimilar to that of the feudal system of the medieval days. We are back in the old age, in the dark ages, when the Roman Catholic Church reigns supreme, like in countries of Africa, and the continent of Africa, or in Haiti, as we just read here. Dave Hunt, an author who you probably know from the book A Woman Rides the Beast, even though that Dave Hunt wonderfully makes a book of 500 pages more or less about Revelation 17, he never understood during his lifetime, or at least he never admitted it, that the papacy is the biblical, historical and prophetic antichrist. I hope that that did not matter for Dave Hunt for his salvation, but even though he was writing such a book, he never accepted or at least recognized the papacy as the Antichrist. But that's not what we're talking about here. He tells us that in Haiti it is said to, uh, Haiti is said to be 85% Catholic and 100% pagan. Every voodoo ceremony begins with Catholic prayers. Likewise, the deadly spiritist cult of Santeria is a blend of African witchcraft and Catholicism carried on in the name of the saints who front for African gods. Unquote. The pagan roots of Roman Catholic practice, described in Alexander Hislop's The Two Babylons, are widely accepted and even leading Catholics have been willing to acknowledge them. John Henry Newman Rome's most famous English convert did so comprehensively. Quote, the use of temples and those dedicated to the particular saints and ornamented on occasion with branches of trees, incense, lamps and candles, votive offerings on recovery from illness, holy water, asylums, holy days and seasons, Use of calendars, processions, blessings on the fields, sacerdotal vestments, the tonsure, the ring in marriage, turning to the east, images at a later date, perhaps the ecclesiastical chant of the Kyrie Eleison, are all of pagan origin and sanctified by adoption into the church. Unquote. From Cardinal J. H. Newman. Hello? This cardinal just said what I say all along. That Roman Catholicism just garments itself with the cover of Christianity and takes all of her tradition into their Christianity. An abomination is that to God. They just give it another name and by that, they can put it all around you and you don't even see it. I don't even go into the ring of the marriage, but you should study that for yourself. When you are going to marry today in our system here and you put a ring on the finger of your wife and she puts a ring on the finger of you, 
That is a Babylonian tradition. It has nothing to do with a marriage as it is biblically meant and ordained by our Lord. Now turning to the east was one point <clears throat> the Cardinal also spoke here of. What does the Bible say about turning to the east? For that we can read in Ezekiel chapter 8 verses 15 and 16. Quote, then said he unto me, Hast thou seen this, O son of man? Turn thee yet again, and thou shalt see greater abomination than these. And he brought me into the inner court of the Lord's house, and behold, at the door of the temple of the Lord, between the porch and the altar, were about five and twenty men, with their backs toward the temple of the Lord, and their faces toward the east. And they worshipped the sun toward the east. Unquote. This ritualistic facing of the east equates both to Catholicism and also to Freemasonry. For example, a master mason of the third degree has to swear his oath of secrecy on the volume of the sacred law facing east. The relationship between Catholicism and Freemasonry at the higher levels is discussed in the section of the papacy and political power of this book. That will be the upcoming chapter 7, so don't miss that. Some contemporary Protestants use up-to-date language to describe the Roman Catholic system and call it a cult. They are at pains to point out that they are referring to the institution and not to the spiritual standing of individuals within it. Apart from the pagan practices listed by Cardinal Newman, the research and scholarship of Hislop, Woodrow and other demonstrates the pagan origins also of the sacrificing priesthood, penances, absolution and the confessional, papal infallibility, the titles Holy Father and Supreme Pontiff or Pontifex Maximus. The worship or veneration of saints and relics, such as the Turin Shroud, and of idols, images, statues and symbols, stone altars, the rosary, the monstrance and wafer, prayers for the dead, extreme unction, purgatory and limbo, plenary indulgences, ritualism, monasticism and mysticism, add to these pilgrimages, crosses and crucifixes, celibacy, the mother and child worship, Mary's continuing virginity, the scapular, canonization of saints, cardinals, nuns, the mitre of Dagon the fish god, fish friday, the mysticis, Lent, forty days of weeping for Tammuz, as in Ezekiel chapter 8 verse 14, the sign of the cross, the sacred heart, Easter, which comes from Astarte of Ishtar, the goddess of spring, associated with the sun rising in the east, baptismal regeneration and justification by works, Peter the rock, rather than Peter's faith in Christ, all these things and many besides are at the heart of modern Roman Catholicism. Not all are widely practiced in Western Protestant countries, but they are nevertheless deeply embedded in church tradition. All are unsupported by scripture and many are expressly forbidden in the Bible, expressly forbidden by our Lord God. Now the chapter is over, but to come to an end, there is a little footnote that I want to read to you on the point of plenary indulgences that I have just read. And that footnote reads, quote, According to an article in the Daily Telegraph on the 6th of July, 1986, quote, Indulgences are now available on live television and radio. Replays of the same program won't do, unquote. <laughs> so you have to watch live <laughs> to get an indulgence. There are 70 official listed ways of obtaining plenary indulgences. Such blessings are the responsibility of the Vatican Department called the Sacred Apostolic Penitentiary, run by Monsignor de Magistratis. The Church teaches that the living can obtain indulgences for the deceased by doing a work such as 
praying the rosary before a blessed sacrament or making the stations of the cross. Catholics who have come to a personal faith in Christ through the scriptures and many who haven't may be shocked to discover that the source of knowledge for Catholic tradition, especially the catechism, is often at odds with the Bible. One example of the most profound importance is the omission of the second commandment. Quote, Thou shalt not make unto thee any graven image or any likeness of anything that is in heaven above or that is in the earth beneath. Thou shalt not bow down thyself to them nor serve them. Unquote. Exodus chapter 20 verse 4 and 5. I think this is not completely King James because I think that um, what is under the waters of the earth is missing here. But I was just quoting from the book and I didn't check every quote, every Bible quote of the book being according to the King James because mostly they are and sometimes they are shortened. So I'm sorry for that. Maybe I have to check that better. On the other hand, always take your own Bible out and check that what I say is according to the Bible. And when that, well, you can point it out, but I pointed this one out. It was a short, a short chapter, I know, but it was a very profound chapter. Just by reading all these traditions that were prescribed already by the scholarship of Hislop and Woodrow, and you know that I wrote, uh, read Woodrow's book on my channel, Babylon Mystery Religion, so turn to that if you want confirmation of that, what I read here. You can see with this few pages that I've just read, five pages in this book, that when you look what the Roman Catholic Church teaches, you are always in battle with what the Bible teaches. So when you are battling against the Bible, you battle against God. I rather battle against man. Mean, I rather battle against the Pope and his system, but I don't want to battle with God because I cannot win that battle. I'd rather adhere to his word and don't make any compromise to his word. And you should neither. Because otherwise you are leaving the small, the narrow path that leads to salvation and you go to the broad road that leads to Rome. And where do you want to spend your eternity? There where Babylon spends its eternity or there where Jesus Christ offers you to spend your eternity? My choice is made. Is yours? Thank you very much for watching the video, listening, commenting. And until next time, Jogler66 from Hour of the Truth signing off. God bless you and bye bye. We as Bible believing Christians, we know that the hand that is behind ISIS, the hand that is behind Al Qaeda, is the same hand that is behind the United States of America government, that is behind the European Union government, and that is behind all the armies in the world, and that is behind all these. Um, mercenary companies out in the world, like XE, or formerly called Blackwater, run by Knights of Malta, etc., etc. So this is something that you really have to understand. This is all just a theater. And the point is, where is this theater going to lead to? When you are a Bible-believing Christian, you know that in the end times, Jesus warned us in Matthew 24 there will be wars, wars and rumors of wars and we know that the Antichrist by peace will destroy many and so on and so on and so on. I could start citing the whole Bible up and down right now with citations like this to tell you what it's all about. But I don't have to sing to the choir or preach to the choir. You as Bible-believing Christians already know that. So the only thing that I ask of you is don't be caught in their game. Because when you are and you play their game, you have to play by their rules. 
and their rules are not Christ's rules. So the only thing that I can advise you of is, okay, take the information in what happens about there, pray for the people that these victims are being taken good care of, and that they are just deceived people, that they maybe have a chance by going through this situation, maybe they have a way to find to Christ in this way. Maybe they have a way to find to the real truth. I mean, these people are Muslims and coming from Muslim countries and coming to so-called, quote-unquote, Christian countries. Of course, the Roman Catholic Church is not Christian. Of course, the Protestant churches today don't preach any protest anymore. All right, I know that. But still, here and there, it is possible that a grain falls on the ground that can fall on fruitful ground, even with these refugees and the whole situation that is coming up. And that is the hope that we should have as Bible-believing Christians, and that is the prayer that we should use every day when we address our Lord to pray for our enemies as we pray for our friends. Because Jesus said, love your enemies and love your neighbor.